Good day and welcome back to the 4G Audi podcast with your host, as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. And I have a very, very special episode for you. And although I say that every single episode is special because it is in its own unique way, today I'm actually interviewing four people as opposed to one person. So as I said to the Neurodivergent crew who I'm going to be interviewing today, um, this is going to be a learning experience for me, and I, I imagine that there's going to be a lot of editing involved. So the topic of today's interview is neurodiversity and creativity. And I have done a episode in the past, which was all about autism and creativity. Uh, but we're going to go a little bit broader. We're going to talk about different things related to ADHD and autism and um, other types of neurodiversities. So today I'm joined by, again, four people. <laughs> we have uh, 12 Gage. Do you want to say hi? Hello, it's me, 12 Gage. Uh, FMA. Hello, I'm FMA. And Dreadnought. How diddly doodly. And of course, uh, no tricks. We have been trying to organize this podcast behind the scenes. We've had a few chats and um, she's been really great in uh, pulling everyone together. So thank you very much. How are you doing today? Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for having us. It's a, it's a great pleasure and uh, a great opportunity to uh, share uh, our stories with you and uh, um, the rest of the world today. <laughs> thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. I love the mask. So I guess it would be good for us to go through a little bit about what you guys are, what you do. Um, I know that you're called the Neurodivergent Crew, and I know that you do a lot of stuff around music. Um, FMA, would you be able to give us the lowdown on um, what you guys are about? Well, I didn't expect you to ask me about Thomas, so I, <coughs> I'm a little... Oh, unprepared. sorry, yeah, but I was, cool. was going to say that. No, 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 it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> uh, well, we are a group of artists who all have different forms of neurodiversity, and we were all, like, spread out, spread out all over the place. And then as our journeys have progressed, we've all found each other and found that we offer things to the collective um that each other was missing so originally it was kind of either just me or callum to start because callum's my son 12 gauge is my son um i'm his dad uh and it, it, i'd given up on music and i was just focusing on script writing and my mm -hmm. son uh 12 gauge when he came to live with me he was writing and writing and writing and he pulled me into it uh like again so then me and uh 12 gauge started performing and doing all sorts of but then we needed someone to make music for us and we were really struggling with that which is where dreadnought suddenly came in and he appeared and he, he was like he fit perfectly and he could do everything that we needed him to do and then we kept going we kept going and everything was struggling we still struggled quite a lot but then no tricks appeared out of nowhere and it was like this final piece of a puzzle that suddenly came in because we're all extremely good at different aspects of things but we're mm -hmm. all missing like Every, everybody w without each other we wouldn't be it's like that thing that you say it's like it's uh the sum of its parts it's like more mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. what we are individually all together we're just something more so that's like the basic idea of how we uh started working together but like since starting to work together uh, it's like it started to get more cohesive and it's like we actually have a message and we encourage people to create and we want to spread like our message of neurodiversity across the world because it's easy when you're sat in your flat like me to think oh yeah every, the whole world accepts autistic people and stuff but then you only need to walk out your door to realize it's not quite that and like the same with dreadnought and adhd and 12 gauge and dyslexia and no tricks with did it's like the world is not built for people like us the world is built for a very specific sort of person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so like yeah that's that's where we're up to with our journey and it's like that's our goal well, thank you very much. I um, I think it's 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 interesting when when we think about neurodiversity because in in my mind it's kind of like having like a different specialized human. Like we're, we're we tend to be good in some areas, but we tend to fall down in other areas. And you know, especially for me, like um, I would never be able to you know, work without the support of like, even, even my neurotypical supporters, um, particularly at work, because they're, they're a lot better at kind of managing the executive functioning side of things. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm like 
pants and, uh, <laughs> and all of that. So I think it's, it's really, really, really interesting that you guys have all come together with different kind of different skill sets and sort of pulling up each other's deficits and stuff. That's really yeah. cool. It is really cool. Um, I guess I want to uh, ask uh, you and 12 Gauge, FMA and 12 Gauge, about your relationship with, with music. Um, learn a bit more about, you know, your story, what kind of music you make, what kind of things you've done. Yeah, well, it all it all begins with 12 Gauge, so 12 Gauge. Yo, um, yeah, uh, so it kind of started um, with music for us. Well, for me, was when I watched my dad perform with his metal band um, for my anger when I was like five or six. And they played at the park just near this flat where we sat right now. And nice. he was on I'm stage. I'm to a bit of metal. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and he was on stage and he was screaming at the crowd and like it was with his band and I, like this six-year-old kid who'd like been bullied and like had tons of like horrible influences at that time that mm-hmm. like frightened me um yeah seeing this person stood on stage just screaming at the crowd i instantly knew i wanted to be on that stage i just didn't know how <laughs> and mm-hmm. then as time went on um kind of i loved metal and i'd listen to metal and dad would play me like slipknot and onyx and stuff like nice. that and then I remember I was in the car with him and he played Eminem um, Relapse and he played that for me. And that nice. was like the moment it all like flipped in my head and it just switched on and it was like, oh, I could do that. And then I started writing and I kept writing and then eventually I came and lived with FMA and I essentially just kept on annoying him really because he was trying to do his stuff he was doing his screenwriting at uni and all that stuff and i'd come in every day and i'd be like oh dad i've just wrote this dad i found this beat dad i've done this dad 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 until the point where he we um my mum said she was organizing this um anti-racism gig and Mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. said that it'd be a really good um point for me to perform and you know develop my confidence and actually perform and it'd be really good if i performed with fma and stuff and then we did that gig and it went better than i think either of us could have expected it to because people were coming into the like the room that we were performing and they were jumping around and there was movement and energy and everything all this stuff and then i'm just stood there this like 15 year old just like whoa so, you were 15? Yeah, yeah. The first gig I did, oh I was 15. <laughs> I, I, I struggled to even talk like talk in front of like one person when I was 15. <laughs> oh, I was the same. Yeah, Callum did. You, you, Callum, Callum had, had a stutter, stutter when we started, we started yeah. which was why his, his mum asked us to do that. He had real issues with stuff. his confidence. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and then since then, it kind of, one thing that my dad for me kept doing was he kept saying, this is the last thing. So we did that first gig when I was 15 and it was like, oh yeah, okay, okay, we'll do one more, but then I'm done. That's it. This is over. And then mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. cool. And then after that next gig, he'd be like, okay, one more, one more gig. And then that <laughs> turned into, you know, oh yeah, we should, we should record an EP, but then it's done, but then it's over. And then it turned into two EPs and then an album. And now we're working on a second album and we've been going, will it be this November that it's been 10 years? We've been doing it. Yeah. So 10 years this November. Yeah. Yeah. Something wow. like that. Yeah. And what, what is it like um, from your side, like uh, FMA, like seeing your son kind of go out there at 15 years old and performing in front of a crowd, like that must inspire some, um, something inside you. <laughs> well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. You can have like a, a like, I can't think of a word for it now, but exclusive. You got. You can. I'll give you exclusive information here. Go for it. Hit me. I I was always like I used to be in the metal band that uh, Twelve Gauge mentioned called For My Anger. There was another singer within that who always took the lead, and he was always so much better than me at talking to the crowd and like doing everything. And it was just like, um, it was like I was always like taken. I was always at the back, but the second I stepped up on stage with uh, Twelve Gauge, um by my side i had more strength 
and more confidence on that stage than I ever have before. Because if there's one thing a parent learns, it's like you can't ever be weak in front of your children. You have to, you have to be mm-hmm. the strong one. Mm-hmm. You have to show them how this world works. And so having Callum, like 12 gauge, I keep calling him by his real name. Having 12 gauge <laughs> by my side was like my hack into the thing and it allowed me to approach the audience in ways that I never would have done before and now I'm cool without 12 gauge by my side I'd still have that same confidence but 12 gauge allowed me to learn to be the best version of me on the stage because yeah that was just one thing if you get on the stage with someone who you want to impress and you're not going to let down and you want to show them the best you then there's no way that you're going to fail so that's my little hack for everyone who wants to perform you need to find that one thing that will make you push no matter what thank you so um i guess just like fo- following your your sort of di- dialogue about how you how you picked up the rest of the neurodivergent crew i guess um dreadnought would you like to tell us a little bit more about your story yeah yeah absolutely um so i guess following on from the story from there picking up like you said from the thread uh, i came in it was after fma and 12 gauge had done the first two eps and mm-hmm. they, they basically wanted to redo these songs to a standard which they had, like the vision of their own music and everything. Um, and at the time, I was producing, and uh, I was a drummer, actually, originally. Uh, that was kind of my nice. main goal at first, music-wise. It was drums more than anything else. Um, you must have very but, good cardio, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> debatable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Um so it, 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 yeah, it was it was that for a while. But I'd always come to Callum like because we both went to the same college and show him mm-hmm. like beats and things I made. Just like in my spare time, just when I go on my break, if I was on breaks and nobody else was on, I'd just go down and be like a little hermit in the studio. And it, nice. they were never like mind blowing, um, but Callum always kind of like poked me to be, go a bit further with it. And he's like, "You think you could see the potential?" And then I'd show him like these lyrics that I'd written for these beats, being like, "Yeah, you, if you want them, you can have them." And of course, like me not really understanding the pride of a rapper being like, I'm yeah. picking those lyrics. But he was, he, was like, he was very much like, you should give it a go. Me? But yeah. I, I, I hit things like I hit things really fast and loud. Uh, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> but he kept he kept at me. He kept me motivated. Uh, and then some time so passed and before. I knew it. Yeah, 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 I did. That was at college that though. But um, I did go to uni for a bit after. Uh, I did media at uni and then still spent most of the time in the stu- the music studio instead. So <laughs> I think it was, a, that, that was, that was the true call in there the whole time. <laughs> Brilliant. But yeah, no, it, it, next thing I know, me and Callum had started a band as well. We were both wearing masks on stage, shouting at people, thinking we were the hardest band since uh, something really, really heavy, insert <laughs> metaphor here, <laughs> you know, and we weren't, but we had the passion and the belief and that's what really carried it, I think. Um, Brilliant. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I, uh, then I met FMA. He brought me and he was like, uh, you're going to meet my dad. And I was like, I'm going to meet your dad. Yeah. You're going to meet my dad. Okay. <laughs> so I had like some prep for that. Um, and I knew it was about like music and stuff. I didn't know what specifically it was originally going to produce like one or two tracks for them before we know it. It's an album later. And here we are in the second album. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a one heck of a journey. <laughs> Brilliant. I really, um, on a, on a, on a separate note, I really like your hat. Like, thank um, you. <laughs> it's very, it's very much my that. aesthetic. Yeah, I, I respect that. Yeah, man. <laughs> it seems like. Have you ever heard of a band called Diant Bird? Diant, yeah, 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 yeah. It's very like um, the whole like Zeph style. The whole, like, Zeph uh, is it? Is poor, it like poor people, but but rich. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love that kind of style. It had like some little rings yeah. on it and stuff, but they were a bit too big. So I was like, mm, that's probably going a bit too far. Yeah, <laughs> jangling about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I guess it's a, g- a good opportunity to uh, move on to No Tricks. Um, would you like Absolutely. to give us a little bit of a lowdown on how you met the guys and um, what kind of music you make? Well, um, I don't even know where to start. Uh, I am a very uh, fresh person in this whole music world because of my uh, DAD, which mm. made me basically live to lives in a short uh, uh, span of time, which is my life. Uh, And um, two years ago, I uh, started uh, making music as a producer uh, and decided that I just cannot live uh, any other way. 
And one year ago, I started the Notrix project, uh, which was from the very start about not only music, but also about mental health, because that's the very mm. uh, reason that I'm here. Uh, if it weren't for my mental health, I might have been... Um, uh, one person instead of two, and uh, then maybe I wouldn't be doing music. Um, but because of the uh, split in my mind, uh, this personality um, only does music. And so I, I started one year ago, and uh, straight away I started sharing my story and uh, everything that I could share about my mental health to make sure that I can motivate people to learn about uh, things, to learn about themselves and not to make mistakes that I uh, made in the past. And uh, while I was expanding, um, I uh, somehow uh, ran into FMA uh, an FMA plus 12 gauge uh, Instagram account and we kind of uh, understood each other very well uh, and, and started speaking about mental health and music and uh, here we are I'm their uh, mix and mastering engineer and uh, uh, we are already uh, doing lots of projects together not only music but also the visuals and everything and then gradually with time we realized that uh, all four of us actually stand for something not only music wise but also uh, ideas wise we share the same ethics uh, mm -hmm. we uh, share the same idea like all of us believe that uh, an artist's responsibility is not to just uh, you know use the their the talents they have just to make Crazy money and, and and <laughs> yeah and hang, hang out exactly uh, but it's also uh, there there is additional responsibility to uh, pass on something to the world to to speak up and to share something that matters uh mm -hmm. so all of us actually believe in, in that and and then we also realize that is such a wild mix that all four of us have four absolutely different diagnoses <laughs> which makes us um like a truly um unique mix uh really um suitable for a superhero movie so <laughs> yes basically yeah. when it was started forming and we realized that together we we are already doing more together but like if we actually go on with our projects uh, as a collective uh that would mean a lot more and it will also help us uh build on onto our uh agenda and our um mission so here mm. we are. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So, um, Mr. Crab? I guess what I want to ask about, because we, we, we've kind of alluded that, you know, you guys are the neurodivers neurodivergent crew. So you, you have different neurodiversities. I guess I want to know a bit more about each of your neurodiversities. And considering that we, we talked to No Tricks um, last, I think it would be really interesting to pick up on the stuff around DID because it's not something that a lot of people are aware of. And I think that, you know, there's also a lot of stigma around it. So it'd be really good to sort of understand a little bit more about it. <clears throat> well, um, where do I start? Well, uh, basically, um, I it's it all started uh, in my adolescent age when um, I had a traumatic experience uh, my father died and uh, uh, I couldn't cope with it at all because my uh, family uh, did not really appreciate me displaying any emotions and uh, I basically wasn't allowed to live through the things that I was experiencing. Uh, anytime when I was, would mention that 
uh, I might be depressed. I might need some um, assistance with that. And I was just, it was all brushed off and I was told that I'm making things up. Um, Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand what's going on, but I was gradually uh, shoving all my emotions more and more into a separate place of my brain uh, where I wouldn't have to live through them. I would just get rid of them. But that's not how it works. You cannot just throw stuff away out of your brain. Mm-hmm. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, basically, it was then already where I already understood that something wrong is going on. And I started feeling that I'm not alone here. There's there's something uh, going on all the time. Like I would just uh, sometimes go go from from one part of brain into the another if, if if that makes sense and i could feel that there is absolutely uh two sp- i actually thought there was more but uh at that point i i felt that there's two uh people inside of me that cannot even uh that don't share anything uh for like during the day let's say with with with, uh, with the people i don't trust i would be one person and I would be basically like they expected me to be and what they wanted me to be. But Mm -hmm. at night I would be another person and absolutely different. And because I was not allowed to be that person, that person was always there in the closet. And Mm -hmm. uh, with time, uh, at first it was, it was possible to organize it in a way where, the person in the closet was just hiding there, uh, just coming back sometimes whenever uh, it was allowed to. But then two years ago, what happened, and it, it is where my music story began, uh, this person just sprung up and couldn't be uh, handled anymore. It's actually me. <laughs> my other self is still there, and, and now it's, it's the reversal Now she's trying to uh, get back uh, into the picture. And what happened there is basically, well, I got diagnosed uh, a year ago. uh, And this is when finally things started making sense. Because what happened two years ago was that when when, uh, things started unraveling and at, at very fast speed and they couldn't be controlled anymore. There were so many things that like really tragic things that happened uh, where um, relationships were broken, lives were broken. Um, So many things happened. I I, I don't really share much about that because it's not my life. It's the life. You you don't need to. Thank you. you no, don't it's need to feel... it's the life of my other self. Uh, mm-hmm. um, there were people involved who lost her as a person. They, uh, some of them, actually admitted that that person died, uh, even though she's still here. But I cannot allow her to uh, get uh, back into the picture because uh, she lived her life for 10 years, not allowing me in. So now it's, we've agreed that this is my time, but um, yeah, basically there are, there are two lives being lived within this body. And uh, if, uh, if years ago, this was, this, the situation were handled the right way. Mm-hmm. If there were therapy, if uh, I, I, my, my emotions were not disregarded. Uh, this wouldn't have happened. And again, I cannot really open up on everything that happened because it's my other sure. self, uh, other personality's life. Uh, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm wearing a mask and I don't disclose my name uh, purely because I don't want anyone to no, because she had a stellar career, a family, lots of friends, everyone who knew her, um, and and all those people 
don't need to know what's happening to me right now. So sure, sure. So basically, uh, all this could have been prevented with therapy, and which is why I uh, feel the absolute need to share my story to make sure that people know what what that is like and to make mm -hmm, sure mm -hmm. that that doesn't happen to someone they know and they love. Well, thank you for being so open and, and sharing that with, with, with me and us. Um, I have to admit, I, I had a, a period of my life actually where I was sort of contemplating whether I had DID. I was going through this very crazy um, time you know, when when you re when you reach adult um, adolescence as an autistic person, or as anyone really, it can be quite a, a hectic time. You don't really know what you feel about certain things. You don't know where to place yourself. You don't know um, who you are as an individual, and you're trying to assert yourself as a new person. And one of the the things that I always really struggled with is emotions, and I find it I found it very sort of disassociating and, and almost existential uh, just how um, different I felt in different emotional states. Now that I'm I'm an adult, I know that, you know, the things that I experienced was, was more along the lines of alexithymia, the fact that I just couldn't actually put my finger on exactly how I was feeling. I just felt differently. So I was like, oh, I must be a different person. And um, I... So, so I, I did a, a little bit of research into it, but I know that the, there has been a lot of sort of stigma around it, and I, I can't imagine how that must that must feel for people such as yourself. I really appreciate you being open about this, and um, I would, I mean, because the topic that we're talking about today is around sort of neurodiversity and creativity. I don't know whether it's it's my place to to ask how. <laughs> how the ideas sort of influence your creativity or is that something that you feel able oh, to talk easy. about? easy. It's actually, it's the <laughs> okay. very reason of the, my creativity because people um, ask me a lot, like, how, how do you find so much inspiration? Because I am just bursting with inspiration. I create things nonstop, like all the time. I don't even have to look for anything. And why? Because... Uh, all those years where, where I was stuck in that closet and I was just collecting all the negative material. The funny thing is that literally us too, exactly because of how the split happened and be, because of uh, the uh, particularities of um, why it happened, um, I was the one receiving all the negativity and I am the pessimistic one. She is optimistic like the the change when 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 there was a, a switch between us the 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 most recent one uh everyone who knew her were were astonished how everything changed in an instant there's a, mm -hmm. an absolutely different person because i got all the dark uh and negative stuff uh into me Mm -hmm. But that is the reason why I, I could create so much. and everything. But everything I create comes from darkness. I tried many times to create something positive because, well, you know, it's just I actually want to be nice uh, to the world. I, wa I want to uh, do good things. So I thought, well, why don't I create something, some nice tunes for people to chill to? It doesn't work. I can only create from all the dark experience that i had mm -hmm. over over the whole of my life so and all of this baggage has been within me and now it's bursting so also i, I kind of feel that we have assigned parts of the brain that are assigned only to us because that personality didn't even listen to music she mm -hmm. couldn't create anything at all she didn't draw she didn't take pictures she didn't do like music not even close to that um whereas i think i'm uh, we, we also are ambidextrous uh which means uh that 
I'm sorry, that's my phone. I hope it doesn't bother you. It sounds um, like an ice cream truck. <laughs> yeah, that's the sound. The sound oh, it is. For, okay. for my speech. Okay. Very <laughs> so, cool. Very cool. Uh, it's um, uh, basically that we're ambidextrous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can ride with both hands. So she yes, yeah. was a, a right handed person. I am like, I'm not left handed, but I can use uh, uh, both hands freely, probably mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. my part of the brain is the uh, right, um, right side of it. So, sure, sure. Uh, so basically, I think this is also one of the things that um, apply to to my creativity, but also the uh, to the mental condition. Thank you very much. And I know that that when we had our pre chat, so I, as I said, me and Nerdrix had our had our pre chat for the neurodivergent crew together, and she sort of helped me um, get in contact and set things up and schedule things and get the questions out. Uh, very much appreciated for that. But I know that. The type of music that you create is dark trap, and um, dark trap is pretty much my number one listen to genre of music, alongside like metal and uh, rap, of course. Um, so I was I was very pleasantly surprised about that, and um, I definitely, you know, I, I, it's it's kind of crazy for me as a as a person because I the way that I present through my personality and the the things that I say, I come across as quite a sort of harmless kind of person, but I really love that kind of dark music and dark humor. And even, even when it comes to like combat sports and stuff, like I find that, you know, I, I can, I can get myself into like a different zone, like, um, you know, whenever I went to a, a competition to do some Taekwondo, I was always very, very aggressive and very, very front foot and always pushing and pressure fighting and stuff. And um, it was very contrary to, I guess, what I, how I am and what I put out there in the world. So I, I, I very much like that that aspect of, um, you know, music, that sort of dark stuff. We, um, we so really you cannot wait that. for for you to hear our track because that's exactly in in that genre, and all four of us participated in it, and it's uh, oh, dropping nice, on uh, nice. January twenty six. Brilliant. Well, um, we can definitely put that out as part of the song of the day. Usually, we do this at the end, but I kind of add different um, songs that that people either identify with or, or feel something from or. Um, really want to share with the world so that would be the the top song that i'm going to put on there <laughs> and um yeah thank you very much for that nerd tricks i guess the the next person that i want to talk to is dreadnought and um would you like to tell us a little okay. bit about your neurodiversity and yeah how that yeah, sort absolutely. of influences your creativity yeah yeah absolutely uh so as we mentioned before adhd um to be honest, like, I mean, like, I was creative long before I even thought about ADHD, to be honest. It was only a few years ago that I actually got my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like, there were, like, major obvious signs, which I was completely oblivious to through the, the past. Yeah, it tends it to was be me. that case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was just like, I, I didn't really click until later, until I started, like, looking into it and putting everything together. And I was like, it was basically like a tick box when I was looking through symptoms and stuff. I was like, okay, yeah, I guess I should yeah. get this looked at by a professional. <laughs> um, but it was like, was there, um, was there any like ignition to you, to you doing that? Was there any reason why you started to look into it? Yeah. Um, it was, it was, I actually looked into it and got my diagnosis. It was, um, and my mental health in general was kind of deteriorating quite a bit at that point. Um, I was struggling with quite a lot of stuff. Like, um, I was like severely depressed, super anxious, and I wasn't myself, but I also kind of was aware of the person that I used to be and I strived to be better. And I, there was that like hunger. So I was like, I need mm -hmm. to get to the bottom of who I am. And everyone had like already, like I'd already heard like years of jokes of like ADHD, but I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Um, but that was one of the first steps into it. And then it was more, I didn't want it treated. Uh, I just wanted to kind of be able to understand myself better. Um, know, where you, the, know where you are in life and yeah, you know, what yeah, kind of yeah. things that you're, good, yeah, you're exactly. perhaps a bit better at 
and which areas you might need a bit of support with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, when you you know when you when you understand, like in this case, when when I understood ADHD better, I understood how it worked. Uh, I also was more open to speaking to other people with ADHD. Then, like suddenly, it was like, oh, okay, I've got this. I can I can interact with these people and ask these questions which relate to myself, which I otherwise might not have been able to like understand that I was actually on the same level mm -hmm. as them, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah, it, yeah, it, it was. Um, it was an eye opener and it definitely set me on a much better path. I, you know, I'm, 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 I like to think I'm pretty mentally healthy right now. You know, everyone has like the days where it doesn't feel like that and you feel like you're backtrack, but it's so much easier sure, to get back sure, on top of yeah. stuff. And I think having that understanding was a massive thing. And uh, then I look back at all my music and I'm like, oh yeah, actually, the, 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 like the signs <laughs> were just right there. Uh, besides well, is it like uh, 150 bpm songs and stuff like that like... but then it was just the <laughs> mad things that i was trying as well and i just thought i was just just being a bit creative and odd but it's like oh, i've been trying to do like hard style metal and like just merging <laughs> like jazz with like reggae you just like all these mad combinations that i was just putting in but then there'd be projects that were like a minute long and I'm like, i'll come back to that and yeah. my desktop yeah. was flooded with hundreds of projects Hundreds, literally. Just, yeah, just, most yeah. of them were unfinished. <laughs> the ones that were finished were, um, they, they were of different standards, but like they were ever growing. Um, but it, the signs were always there. But that energy and that spontaneity, I think, really, really helped from the production aspect. Um, mm -hmm. It really helped me kind of find my own style along the way and try things that, like, you know, I might might not otherwise have come to my mind if I didn't have like these sporadic. Like, give you an example like it's just a stupid idea it's like i sampled um a cow in one of fma and 12 gauges songs i just yeah. it was just a sample on the side on the list i was like you know what it'd be really funny if i can work this in somehow i put it through a thousand different plugins it, it didn't sound like a cow at the end <laughs> but was, like things like that it was a really cool sound by the end of it and i was like yeah it's just the thought process that maybe i wouldn't have gone down if it went for adhd <laughs> hmm. i um I had a podcast that, that came out a little bit re more recently. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm always a bit tentative around giving time frame for stuff because the, 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 the order in which I release things tends to be a bit like all over the place. Oh, do I want to release that one or this one? Or like, mm -hmm. so sometimes they're not always like in order. And um, I, I was talking to a autistic rapper called SD Flame. And he, he also has ADHD and he was talking about sort of the benefits and, and difficulties when it came to doing his rap music, you yeah. know, like he's very high tempo and he's got, he's very, very like quick when he, when he's speaking and yeah, he's yeah. very sort of fast verbal. Um, and so yeah. like a lot, a lot of the people like who come up in the rap and then trying to sort of develop their skills, they're actually taught to go faster like they're uh, taught to process things quicker and speak faster whereas yes. for him it was more about learning to like breathe and chill out and like um is it is very cool is uh it kind of sounds a little bit like eminem which yeah, um yeah. really really i'll really definitely check him out after that that's really funny that you say that though <laughs> Uh, like looking back and like early stuff, I was just constantly like, da -da 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 and that was like my natural like go to. It was like how many syllables kind of fit into this line yeah, yeah. to the point where yeah. on stage I was like, I couldn't breathe through half my songs. I'm not yeah, gonna like, lie, turning into really Buster cool. Rhymes. Yeah, 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 fully. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very much the same kind of journey there, actually. And now, like you know, I've just finished what I would say is my mm -hmm. first official single after trying all sorts of different things. It's the first thing I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like going to be all over. Um, and I tried the exact opposite. You know, I tried some really slow flows and some other stuff. And that's something that I wouldn't have been able to do at the start. Because like you say, it's the speed comes naturally <laughs> with ADHD. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I can yeah. word vomit all over for like hours if I wanted to. So I have to stop myself now. Fortunately, I'm quite good at just being like, right. Okay, let's bring it down. <laughs> Bit of <laughs> <It's>, details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Brilliant. That, 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 I've spot on and i never thought about that it's really interesting that you mentioned that thank you very much for that dreadnought it's all good um <laughs> we're gonna um don't know do you guys do you 12 gauge and fma do you guys want to um speak together like do you want to kind of address different things or do, do i want to speak I... alongside my son whoa yes yeah uh no we can talk different our stories are very different so i'm cool doing it separately 
Brilliant. Well, um, do you want to go first? Do you want to tell tell me a little bit about how you discovered your neurodiversity <clears throat> and what kind of journey uh, well, you've been on, how it affects your creativity? Uh, my journey is very, very different to everyone else's because I'm 43 years old now um, mm -hmm. and I wasn't diagnosed until I was 36. So my life was very troubled. So uh, one of the things like with autism is you get obsessed, don't you? You get obsessed about absolutely mm -hmm. everything. You find you find a piece of music and you listen to five seconds of it over and over again or you hear someone say a word and you use that word in everything that you've ever done. And then <laughs> you find a film and then you watch that film until you know every word and you don't understand why no one else wants to watch that film with you, even though that's the yeah, only thing you ever yeah. talk about. And so I, not knowing that I was autistic, um, as a kid, I had like a really good imagination, but then as soon as my teenage years hit, it felt like all these walls that were in my head fell down and they like mm -hmm. protected me from the world, did these walls, it protected me from sights and sounds and all sorts of things. Cause you got so much energy as a kid and then you're told mm -hmm. to sit down in high school and learn and the information was just overwhelming and I didn't realize I was being overwhelmed. I didn't realize I was struggling. I didn't realize I couldn't talk to people. Uh, and so one day when I found alcohol, I was like, wow, this is like the greatest thing in the world. This like eased everything. And I was 14 years old when I found alcohol and then mm -hmm. I very quickly, uh, almost drank myself to death. And by the age of 21, I was in rehab oh, and I was in rehab for a year and a half. Um, and I had Callum at the age of 19. Um, so yeah, so I was in rehab for a year and a half and then I came out of rehab and they'd kind of cured the alcoholism kind of, I say kind of, cause I still, I had a, well, I have many relapses, but every time I drank, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't drunk though. Like my body was drunk, but my mind wasn't drunk. That drunk feeling never, ever came back. Like mm -hmm. the, it, it's really, really weird how they reprogram my brain but like i'm like a sponge for information as well so every day in rehab i was just like absorbing all and all this information mm -hmm, and learning mm -hmm. um because in rehab you need to learn the rehab that i went to and rather than relying on the 12-step program or stuff like that what the rehab did but i went to they taught you how your brain worked and because when you're an alcoholic or an addict uh you tend to have a drink and you blame it on something small and it's not mm -hmm. that that happened. It's something that happened like five days ago that led to this snowball effect. And so in rehab, yeah. they teach you to follow the thoughts back and discover where they're all coming from. So I spent mm -hmm. a year and a half mm -hmm. of like learning that. So I came out of rehab with all this knowledge and all this wisdom, but I was a 20, like 23 year old. And so all my social skills had been damaged from over drink. Then all my social skills had been damaged on top of that from over rehab. And I couldn't drink. I couldn't go out and drink. So I started to be very, very insular. And like, I found it really hard to talk to people. Talking to people would make me anxious. And mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. someone, a girl would maybe say, oh, uh, it was nice to see you. And then I'd go home and I'd be like, did she mean it was nice to see me? Or is that what people say? And it was like so confusing. You'd get these really simple sentences and yeah. they would be so simple that they would cause you to break down. Like you mm -hmm. don't understand, like, because people talk in such strange ways um but like uh, and all that kept going on i'd get more addictions so i got addicted to painkillers got addicted to other drugs and all sorts of things and it's like no matter what i did i couldn't stop the addictions and mm -hmm. uh then at the age of 32 or something i went to uni to study and at university i, I saw this on one of your posts on social media you had a very similar experience that i had at uni uh, i tried yeah, to fit the, in the alcohol is well it's it go on Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, at uni, no, I meant what you meant. You, you said you were very isolated from people at uni. And I had yes, the exact yeah, same thing. I yeah. tried to fit in. Everyone was going out freshers week. Everyone was mm -hmm. going out drinking. Everyone was invited everywhere. And I wasn't invited any place, any time, mm -hmm, ever. Mm -hmm. And it was like, there were people who spread rumors in class about me and things. Because I was always honest. And I assumed everyone else was always honest. So I let yeah. people know I was an alcoholic and I had addiction issues. Because I thought that's what you should do. But little did I know you, you that... Be, people... You're being honest and open. You're yeah. not lying. You you know, you're putting stuff out there. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Because if you don't have sort of an awareness of, of autism, because in, in a lot of people's mind, even when we, we hear stuff about autism, you kind of always jump to these kind of very extreme stigmas of what you think it is. And it's very hard to like, it's like a wall for, mm -hmm. for you being able to identify yourself with that yeah. because it's so, so out there and 
you know, you feel like it's a separate thing to you. And um, I think, you know, definitely one of one of the biggest contributors to me with, with my issues with with alcohol was alexithymia. You know, not being able to attach my my thoughts and and experiences to my emotions. Yeah, and it's really interesting when you said about you know something happened like five days ago, and then you're trying to manage it now by by using the the substances to kind of help with that, and that that's kind of a lot to do with with my experience of like having that separation. It's like right, I feel stressed. I I only know that I feel bad. I don't know why I feel bad, but I I just know I feel bad, and there's no way to process that in any way because I don't know what the cause is and um I think that's that's a really I think I like in, in in general especially you know related to autism um yeah. it's very very it's not very understood and I think it's you know it definitely has a really big impact on our ability to like regulate ourselves um and I, I know in general that the statistics around addiction and around alcohol are, are really, really, really tough. Um, it doesn't help that alcohol is so glorified yep, it's in crazy. the UK. It's, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's insane. Just you know, the amount of events that, as you said, during Freshers Week, the amount of events that go on. It's, it's pretty much a haven for for binge drinking. Yeah, and you know, something that that people don't you know, that I didn't see around university, nobody told me, is that there is actually like a really hefty amount of deaths associated with binge drinking. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's very hard hitting, like to, for, for me to come across that information, just be like, geez, like, how is this still happening? Like, how is this still a thing? Why, why is, why is it such a, such a part of our culture that we go out and consume this, this this substance very readily like our parents are like hey do you want some do you want some alcohol do you want a beer with this with with this meal your friends are like oh i brought you know a bottle of vodka let's drink this it's it's mad um and the the effects of it are you know almost immediate you have withdrawal you it's the only drug hangover uh, it's the only drug i like me some rehab uh, but it's the only drug that affects every single part of your body. When I'd gone into mm. rehab, the backs of my legs, my calves had, had cramped. They would not, like, um, r- relax. It was really horrible, was that? But, yeah, uh, alcohol is the only thing that affects, like, everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it affects it's your just, brain, affects your yeah. liver, your blood vessels, your heart. It's, it's, it is it is it is absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, but I, I know we're not talking specifically about alcohol in this it's podcast, cool i but... could talk about alcohol all day if you wanted to <laughs> thomas um but yeah so uh, yeah so i was at uni and like it turned really bad and then i had to take a year out mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. to recover because that's like i had like the worst year of my life in 2013 um and then i spent a whole year to like preparing and going back and i just smashed it when i got back and I got a first. I finished off of my class. I was on the radio nice, and newspaper nice. and everything. But then as soon as I finished uni, I got, I had an IQ test around that time. Like mm. um, a friend was like studying to be a doctor and they tested out the proper IQ test, a two hour one, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. the one with all sorts of things. And I enjoyed all of it, but uh, my processing speed on it was really, really bad. And they said like when the results came back that I had strong signs of autism. So I went yeah. to a guy, a guy though. I went to someone, a doctor, and they diagnosed me with autism. And that moment was the craziest moment ever because my processing speeds are so slow anyway. I'll get upset mm-hmm. by something today, but I won't react to it for like another few days. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's like, yeah. but this thing was so big. This was like looking back on my entire life and everything was different. And like the only it's, good example I have is like, it's a twist at the end of a film. Like you watch this massive film and then suddenly they say, oh no, but the like, it was this mm-hmm, way. And you're mm-hmm. like, what? And that's exactly how I thought. And I, it, what's crazy is I went through all the stages of grief. There was denial. There was anger. There was sadness. There was like yeah, loss yeah. and like, yeah. But as soon as it like clicked, that that's what was going on and because one thing my autism gives me is this amazing ability to sense patterns and solve puzzles and like i see patterns everywhere it's like it makes songwriting and script writing and anything creative really really good because i feel the patterns when they're in place and so 
when I was looking back at my life, it allowed me to see this pattern of creativity. And every time I'd created something, I was getting out the stuff that was in my head. And I'd done it all my life. And it was only at that point that I was like, this is how I keep myself well. This is how I stop drinking. This is how I keep the addictions under control by Mm -hmm. keep making things. And so from that point on, it became like my mission to like keep creating and tell people how important creativity is because it really does save lives. It like keeps you well. It allows you to get out all the subconscious thoughts. It allows you to get out all the horrible thoughts, all the nasty things, all the horrible experiences. It allows you to get them out in a really productive and safe manner and put take like literally take them pull them from yourself and put them somewhere else but Mm -hmm. like but where my brain is it like it constantly fills up with this stuff like all the sensory input and all the bad thoughts and things yeah so the creativity is a constant job so it's like i'm forever like grabbing bits like like a bucket and you're trying to poke some holes into it to let the let the water come out exactly (laughs) and so yeah when i got that my diagnosis that's what clicked and it was like this is what's what Mm. my life is and this is what i should be doing with my life my um my good friend uh, Brian Bird he he does a lot of like um public speaking around the country he's um a very late diagnosed individual um and he he talks a lot about sort of the the experience of late diagnosis it's kind of like um you you're basically challenging the the whole identity that you've had for the majority of your life and the the older that you are the the more like hard hitting it is and it is kind of in a sense mourning but it's also like sort of being born again like mm-hmm. you've had a you've had a new you're having a new adolescence you kind of looking back through your life and picking things out and going you know the stuff that you gave yourself a hard time you pick it out and you like look a bit more closely in the lens of yeah. in the lens of autism I and felt suddenly, very sorry it, suddenly for myself. The, like, su- yeah. Suddenly the 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 picture changes a little bit, and it's it's kind of like you see that event from a whole different new angle. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I, I felt very sorry for the younger me, the one who didn't have a clue what was going on, because yeah. it was. I just I don't wish, but if there was someone there to just help and just say, "Oh, this is how things should be," which is kind mm-hmm. of like what happened with me. And 12 gauge, like when Callum came to live with me, it was like, mm-hmm. that's what I did. I was like, I did what should have been done with me with uh, 12 gauge. Cause I just needed someone to pick me up and hold me tight and say, right, that's not how things work. This is how you should do it. And this is why you should do it. And that's what happens when you don't do it like that. Cause people just give instructions. Don't be like, ah, don't drink too much. You'll die. And like, okay, I'm not dead. I'm doing what I want and you'll drink as much as you want. <laughs> but like, and so like, they don't, they don't give you the detail, do they? Yeah, they don't say like, to... right, this is what happens in your brain and yeah. this, these chemicals yeah. go up and yeah, like, uh, it's just, it's like, it's like what the doctors do. It's like when they yeah. tell, um, you know, people who are becoming very, very overweight and obese, they tell them like, you need to lose weight. It's like, why? Yeah. Like, well, well, what's that going to do? How am I supposed to do it? Um, they just kind of give you this list of things that you're supposed to do when you, they're all very, very complex things and they, they have lots of different aspects to them that you kind of have to work through and try out. And, um, they just don't communicate that in a way that, that, that people take it seriously. Cause it's like, Oh yeah, the doctors, yeah. Exercise. Yeah. Eat well, sleep well. Like, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know. Definitely. It's yeah, no, it's just mad. It's just a mad world that we live in and just a mad society as well. But yeah, that's that's basically my story and that's why I create. It's like it keeps me well and it keeps me mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. important. And it keeps me happy more than anything else. Uh definitely. Thank you very much for that. And um Twelve Gauge has been sitting very 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 quietly in the background yep. waiting for the time to uh <laughs> yeah best to last and all that go for um, it mate tell us about your story um yeah so kind of i wasn't really diagnosed like i'm dyslexic um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i found that out after high no um the first year of college so i'd gone mm-hmm. through exams i'd gone through all that stress and then after that, um, you do like, what is it? It's like a standardized, um, learning difficulty test or something like that. 
it's like just a yeah. standardized test. You do it every beginning of the year to see if you've got learning difficulties. And mm -hmm. they were like, I, I finished it in probably around five minutes. It was meant to take like 15. Mm -hmm. And I was just <laughs> like, yeah, that, that, this one, this one, done. And um, then the, the, the teacher comes around and then they're like, all right, Callum, um, you, you, you're going to have to take that again. And I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. why? And then they stay with me the entire time. And, I, and I, this time I proper go through it. And then they're like, I'm like, all oh, right, yeah. So, so I scored like an, an 80. Is that good? And then they're like, no. It means that you probably um, <laughs> have some learning difficulties. And then I went into college and they gave me a proper thing. And I found out I was dyslexic. And weirdly, it was like how I see it is like, a very micro miniature version of how FMA said, because I hated mm -hmm. school. I always hated school and education, all that stuff. I just despised it. And when I look, it's very visual, isn't it? Oh yeah. Especially like a, and like when school I look with back, the whiteboards and the blackboards and stuff. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's like when I look back on it, cause what dyslexia has done to me is that if you give me a set of instructions right now, my brain will manage to flip them by the time you've I'd like I it comes for me to do it. So if you gave me like mm -hmm. the instructions to get to the shop and I was like, okay, so it's it, it's a left, then a right. I will go right and then left yeah. and then get completely yeah. lost. And um that's so it's like of, like having a mirror, yeah. a mirror in your brain. Like Yeah, pretty much. And that kind of was my experience of school. So I was in like bottom set for everything with all like the bad kids mm -hmm. and, you know, the people with undiagnosed learning difficulties and the diagnosed learning difficulties. And people just thought I was stupid, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, I had like major confidence issues. So that didn't help pretty much. I was in. He's, it, mm. it can be very destructive, can't it? Because. Oh, yeah. It is, you know, school, as you, as you said, the sets, they kind of divide you into different learning groups yeah. and you automatically, you know, assign assign people as smarter when they're when they're higher up in the sets. Yeah. But when you when you have a learning um, difficulty, it kind of puts a little bit of a block between you and the information that comes in. Yeah. Um, my uh, one of my family members um very, very, very smart individual. Um, I was, has a lot of potential. Was really, really crushed by their experience with being dyslexic. They took it like a, as a very, very personal thing. It's like I don't have dyslexia. It's not. It's not something that re requires a lot of attention. It's just that I'm stupid and I can't do this and I can't yeah. do that. And the the thing is, is that they they are actually very, very intelligent. Very, very good at. Uh, socializing very very yeah talented i would say and it's kind of that experience of the, them at school really really made sort of um their confidence levels very 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 low oh yeah it ends up mm -hmm. um like for me it became because alongside that i was bullied and i had like a really abusive step parent mm -hmm. when i was a kid and it just kept mounting was like all of this stuff where it was literally beating me down at an incredibly formative point in my life i'd say yeah and it led to me viewing the world in an extremely dangerous way so mm -hmm. i became because because the nuts thing is is like I completely, well, FMA is my dad, so I relate to him Yeah. Um, yeah. in a weird way. Not even in a weird way, he's my dad, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> of course, of course, well, of I course relate your relatives. Him. He's my relation. <laughs> um, yes, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when I first, on TV, when I saw people have relationships, like having a girlfriend and... Mm -hmm having alcohol and having these things that instantly made those characters happy just instant yeah yeah like there was no sort of build up there wasn't any self improvement there wasn't looking in yourself it was i have a beer i'm good now and yeah, i yeah. became 
incredibly obsessed with a ton of things at an age that I shouldn't have been obsessed with them at mm-hmm. all. So it's like I have vivid memories of being like really young and putting my mum's wine in like a Ribena bottle and going into primary school with that and stuff like that. Not oh enough that I'll be drunk, but in my head it was like, that's the thing that makes me feel good. And these yes, things yeah. kept developing and I kept like through the way that school kind of isolates you when you have learning difficulties of just keeping you mm-hmm. kind of in the bottom set and just keeping you away from like all these other kids. And you're in probably the class with a lot of people who have issues and who Mm -hmm. maybe aren't the nicest people through no fault of their own, but you're in those classes. And it just kept reinforcing this behavior until the point when I had to literally, my mum said that I couldn't live with her anymore and I needed to go and live with FMA. And that was where music started. But the only thing that was the connective throughout all of that was rap and writing lyrics and that mm-hmm, was like mm-hmm. the only thing i became like hyper obsessed with that like listening to like why do you why mm. do you think you gravitated towards rap music like why not sort of mainstream pop why not metal why not why not reggae um, like i think what it genuinely was um looking back on it was metal was angry and i've always liked yeah. metal but rap there were like two major things one there was the confidence of it yes, and the yeah. confidence that they were talking about all of these like systemic racist messed up lives that they had lived mm. and they were now in a position where they were telling you that they are the best thing on the planet they are that confident and they've gone through yeah so much crap and pretty much the next thing that i just really liked about it was i think it at a point in my life where i felt extremely lonely and isolated in school and by a supposed friend group that i had at that time where i was the punching bag of that friend group um i relate (laughs) yep yep (laughs) and it's it's also weird isn't it because you don't clock onto it until you look back no. at it when you're a kid it's like oh yeah they're, 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 these are my friends these are who i go and hang around at lunch and then when you look it's like you don't have the the, the ability yeah. to be serious about anything like yeah to take anything personally because you just like oh well this must be what life is like and yeah you know there's nothing wrong with this because this is all i know and yeah yeah and you just kind of eventually like looking back i think you just clock onto the fact of no those weren't jokes. You were all pointedly mm-hmm. joking at me. You weren't making jokes yeah. with me. They were at me. And yeah, so that was like the friend group and stuff. So when I listened to rap and it were these people just being hyper confident and then I'd hear a punchline mm-hmm. and I'd understand that punchline. I felt like the cleverest mm-hmm. person on the planet in yeah. like while I was at school and, you know, they, they were like bottom set, you know, you, you can't do division or long form multiplication or any of this stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I was like, yeah, but I understood the line that DMX just said, did you? <laughs> and it turned into this whole thing where I genuinely saw when I look back on it, I genuinely think that those were my friends. Mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. rappers who would tell me about their yeah. lives and would give me these stories and these positive stories of why not to go to jail and, you know, what yeah. to do in these situations and stuff. And I just loved it. And it became, as a kid, it became almost a thing because that same friendship group, when I mentioned I wanted to rap or be a rapper, they were immediately like, oh, you can't do that. You you, you yeah. just can't. One thing that they liked to do was in classes, they would give me random words to rhyme until yeah. I couldn't rhyme a word. And then yeah. they would proceed to then, you know, have a massive thing at me about, see, this is why you can't be a rapper. You need to rhyme words all the time. And then yeah, so it's literally like, yeah. 
you rhyme and rhyme and rhyme and you do all these yeah. like you're literally doing what they ask you to yeah. do but as soon as it comes to a point yeah. like they just keep going and going yeah yeah and then, and then it, of course at some point you're gonna like anyone's gonna yeah have ish, like difficulties doing that yeah and it, it kept repeating but that gave me the kind of chip on my shoulder i think i needed mm-hmm. to pursue rap like not all of the other horrible things that like my brain became obsessed with but to pursue rap i think that really helped because it literally made rap my only focus mm-hmm. writing was my only focus it was i didn't like school my friends weren't really friends the only thing i had was listening to rap and writing rap and that was it mm-hmm. And then with that same energy, when I came to live with dad, who'd already been in a band, who'd played me rap before and who I knew had done all these things I wanted to do, it was like having personal access to Eminem. And I just went absolutely ballistic. It was like every day. (laughs) And yeah, and like dad said, he, he managed to get me at a point in my life where he was able to make me view the world in the correct way because i think when you have um an addictive personality and problems with addiction anything Mm -hmm. can become obsessive absolutely anything and that could be from you know drinking to exercise to absolutely anything and i've become obsessed with Uh, it's okay it's it's interesting that you mention exercise because i i i was i was terribly addicted to it I, i i kind of Literally every night I would go out um, in like the freezing cold winter with like mm. a t-shirt on and just run for like hours and hours yeah. in the dark. Like <laughs> my mom used to get really, really worried about me. Yeah. But um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was crazy. Yeah. I I really struggled at, at that time with like my sleep and stuff. Mm. And I didn't really know how to deal with it. So the way that I sort of, got rid any time that i felt any level of anxiety mm. alertness anything like that i would just drop down and do like push-ups until i couldn't do them yeah and then i'd get up and i do sit-ups and then couldn't do them and then i do squats yeah. and it, it really did get get to a point because mm. i had i had some issues when i started to do taekwondo because there's a lot of stuff around like weight classes and stuff yeah and um there's a big issue because my, my appetite wasn't very good at the time. Mm. So I was constantly exercising, constantly like breaking down my body and not giving it time to recover. And then I, on top of that, I wasn't eating. So it was like, yeah, um, it was definitely, definitely looking back on it. Yeah. A lot more akin to an exercise addiction than like mm. pure passion. I was, I was kind of, I was, I was weird back then. I was like in my own little headspace about, Honestly, I was um, watching anime and Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> and I was like, "I'm gonna be a superhero." I yeah. like, they see One Punch Man doing like 100 push-ups, and I was yeah. like, "Yeah, I'm gonna do that." And... Honestly, I find it so weird, like that you say that, because I, I, I would kind of say I still am. There yeah. are like I, I think when there's certain times like in formative years where you can experience things and it pushes you to focus on something. So Mm. it's like I had an abusive stepdad dad and was bullied and stuff like that. And as a kid, that makes you feel powerless. And when you Mm. look on media and you see like huge guys and they're powerful and you're like, yeah, "Yeah, that's it. That's, that's like how I feel agency and how I feel strong and i i genuinely had like the same thing like i remember during covid was possibly the worst point for that was Mm -hmm. when i um i decided during covid because there's nothing else to do i'm gonna get ripped i'm gonna get huge i'm gonna come out of covid (laughs) and i'm gonna be a tank and like and like i'm i'm thin i'll admit it now but like I am thin, and I probably will. Never... Oh, I used to, I used to do yeah. the same. People used to take the mick out oh, of yeah. me because every time that they poked like my arm or something, I'd like tense. But they mm. knew that I was tensing. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> oh, I was so like skinny yeah. back then. But looking back, I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, but oh, that was cringe. It... Like... <laughs> but yeah, it, it becomes like this thing where, like, to me at that time, it was like, yeah, I'm I'm gonna get out of COVID. I'm gonna be a tank. It's new reality. Yeah, and. Yeah. 
what I remember is that I also understood nothing of nutrition. This was where I first mm-hmm. went wrong in the in the grand scheme of becoming a tank. Um, was <laughs> I knew nothing about how to fuel myself or how to correctly rest or how my body yeah. would recover. Yeah. So it was literally, I think it was five days a week. I would go on a walk in the morning. I would come back and I'd do this like mental push up, weight lift thing, and mm-hmm. I would pretty much eat six eggs drink free protein shakes before every meal (laughs) and then this inevitably happened where i had a kidney storm that developed into a kidney infection oh Oh dear that and that was like the the worst wake-up call i could have had (laughs) because instantly in that in that moment i was like this is so severe this pain it was like the first time Mm -hmm. i couldn't sleep through pain and it it was that proper thing, but it properly taught me at that point that like everyone is different. Like my body will not look like someone else's body, but it's mine and it functions in its own way. And I've got to understand that. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's, I, I just find it mad the amount of things that you can become obsessed and addicted to because it could mm-hmm. even become mm-hmm. like TV. Well, yeah, everyone's addicted to yeah. TV, but like, you know, you can get addicted to media or some form of like, like one really odd thing is that my grandma is addicted to chocolate and only <laughs> chocolate. That is it. it it's yeah. not like, you know, binge eating sugar or sugary things. It's just chocolate. And yeah. that's what I found like so kind of interesting and mad. And I'm really glad that I came to live with my dad and he taught me how that actually functions because I know that if Mm -hmm, I didn't mm -hmm. have that, the amount of things I would be struggling with now would be immense. I would just be, you know, fixating on anything that would make me feel different. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. It's cool. I I wanted to ask one more question because, you know, um, might, might, might be a little bit of the elephant in the room, but um, autism tends to be very genetic. Do you think that you're autistic as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the whole group is autistic to a point. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Definitely on some form of the spectrum as well. I think. But it's a bit uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a good question. Um, I, I think I am. So it's usually the opposite way around. It's mm. like, like. Like when I got diagnosed, I was like, hmm, my dad seems a bit similar to me, seems yeah. to have the same sort of issues as me. Yeah. And then I talked to other people and they're like, oh yeah, my dad's the same. Oh, he doesn't want to know anything about it. Like, <laughs> whereas you guys, it's like, hmm, go, yeah. go for it. Sorry, I'm um, speaking over you. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I find it, this is, this is the honest thing with it is... I think I could very well possibly be. That was a very Mm -hmm. roundabout way of saying yes. Um, (laughs) But yeah, um, I do hyperfixate. I do become overwhelmed, um, especially Mm -hmm. with information. I can get like very overwhelmed with that. The thing is, is that I know how my brain works. Sure. And that's the thing. I know that, um, like, in the back of my mind, I know that that diagnosis would explain a lot, but I also know mm-hmm. that my brain could use that as an excuse. So if there was something sure. I didn't want to do or I was, you know, feeling too tired to do, and, like, I could just be like, oh, I'm just, you know, da 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 today. And that's kind of the thing, I think, for me. At least. I, I think everyone, if they feel like they need it, should have a diagnosis and stuff like that. But I also kind of just think it's me as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I, I completely get I completely get that. I think it's um I mean obvious, obviously it's 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 not always as clear as that. Mm. You know, my m- m- It'd probably it'd probably give me give me a good telling off if I said this, but I I'm pretty sure my dad's autistic mm. and he he kind of over the years he sort of warmed up to the idea. Mm. My um, dad. Then, then again, I'm sorry. Then again, my um my brother mm. he's he's not. 
So it's not always the case that it kind of passes down and yeah, yeah. But I, I would, I would definitely um, look into it because I know that um, from talking to uh, the, the, there was this documentary that I made as part of my final year at university. Mm. Um, I did biomedical sciences and I looked into like the link between autism and mental health because mm. there wasn't really much out there at the time. Yeah. Although there was the statistics out there, but there wasn't actually any media being made about it, even though it's just like glaringly horrible and mm. depressing to look at like the stats on it. Um, and I made this documentary and one of the people that I interviewed was a man called uh, Peter Bainbridge who ran this like, I don't know how to describe it, some, it was kind of like a, a mediating service. He's autistic himself. He was late diagnosed and um, he was, he, he, he goes about and he tries to, to mediate between autistic people and the family members or like the law or like things related to housing and landlords mm. And one of the things that he said is that a lot of a lot of people, especially when you know, for for people um, like in their early twenties or, or or mid twenties, um, you kind of you kind of go through life, you kind of focusing on other things, and as at some point, um, you know, that an issue will come up, which mm. is related to like autism, like. Um, you know, something that you can't fix, you know, you, you might perhaps gone through your entire life repeating the same kind of routine, just being very happy going about and doing stuff. And then suddenly something just jumps in yeah. and you're like, oh, I don't know how to process this. Yeah. And um, he, he says that that's quite a, it's quite a common thing mm. like to happen. And it's, it, it sometimes ends quite badly for the, for the individuals who really haven't mm. looked into it. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying. Um, I'm. I'm more speaking to the audience. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving my story. I'm not saying to you like. Oh yeah. Go and get yourself an autism diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. I just think that I'm. <laughs> I'm not doing. I'm that. kind of blessed to have supportive people around me who oh, yeah, understand sure, sure. mental health. I know that mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there who don't have that, and I know that if I didn't have that, I would definitely be searching out a diagnosis mm -hmm, if I mm -hmm. like really required it so i do encourage everyone yeah i'm, so, I'm to, sorry if that was oh don't worry about it man. at all misconstrued don't, worry. Me, don't like, worry about that talking down to you I, I didn't mean to do it like that but um okay yeah yeah, yeah. Don't, so, worry, um, don't have to apologize <laughs> his granddad's okay. definitely autistic boy even though he doesn't have a diagnosis my dad is unbelievably Mine too. autistic and the, yeah. and, the, and the worst bit is that me my mum and my little brother have a sneaking suspicion that my granddad on my mum's side of the family is also autistic he he, he turned around and said like the funniest thing and it that this mm -hmm. is fine he hates computers he will never listen but he said the funniest thing to me where like like he he just walked into the room and just sat on the like sofa and me and my mum sat there and then he's like he's like oh yeah I've 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 been hearing about this new autism thing yeah and like you don't <laughs> like you don't like loud noises and like people yeah. keep saying that I might be but I'm definitely not but you know when they play music in Tesco's I hate it and he just like I was like <laughs> all right <laughs> and then he just like picked up his paper and just kept yeah. reading and yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's it's funny, isn't it? It's it's that whole thing of not being able to identify with the label because mm. of the the stigma, the wall of stigma that's in the way. Um, and the the I find that particularly for my granddad, um, absolutely absolutely no chance, no chance in hell that I'm ever going to convince him at all that he might be on the spectrum. And it it would probably help him a lot and help him process a lot that's oh, yeah. gone on in his life, but. Yeah, well, um, thank you for for telling telling me you all <laughs> you all telling me about your stories. Um, another aspect that I, I I really want to talk about um is I guess I guess more related to like mental health because uh, I know that um, FMA was talking about um sort of how how creative how the creative side of himself could, was used to to sort of process things and to, to have an outlet for negative emotions and experiences. And I really feel that like it's something uh, for me that, 
you know, fr- through my work, through my my podcasting, through uh, my writing. Um, cre- creativity has always been a really, really big part of me, even going back to the times when I was in uh, early teenagehood, I'd be writing this really crazy depressive poetry about like <laughs> all sorts of really dark stuff. And um, I always had that kind of outlet. And I think for me, uh, definitely, I mean, the, the, there was a point in my life where, well, I mean, to be honest, ever since I was about 14, where I was trying to understand myself and I was trying to um, process what was going on on with me, the only real outlet that I had was, you know, the poetry and listening to music. And um, there wasn't really any way that I could verbalize exactly how I was feeling because I didn't understand all of the aspects of autism and, and you know, particularly the stuff around alexithymia. But uh, to, to stop myself from rambling, no tricks. Would you be able to uh, talk a little bit about, you know, so some of the benefits that have come from getting involved with with music well i can finally say exactly what i feel and yes it does involve uh my mask on i'm a very open person uh but uh, with regards to some really, really uh, dark things within me, like the uh, uh, really bad thoughts, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm used to not, you know, opening up on those things. And uh, with music, I started being much, much more open. And mm-hmm. all my songs are basically like every single song that I ever made um, uh, was inspired by some event that, that made me very emotional and very unhappy. And I just wrote a song about it. Basically the, the whole music project was around that. I needed, I was just like you writing uh, poetry first. And then yeah. I also <laughs> my, realized that. My mom that was the same. My mom was the same. She 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 um she hasn't she's yet to show me this this very depressing poetry, but I'm I'm waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, well, depressing poetry. Then I realized that I actually want to sing that poetry. Then I realized mm-hmm. that there is no one really there to help me and make music for it. So I'm gonna do it myself. So I went to school to uh, uh, study music production, and uh, there we are. But it, it's always about. Uh, those verses it's always about uh, getting those things out there Uh, and uh, I just recently released uh, my first EP which has uh, five songs and all of those five songs are uh, based on uh, five different um, uh, emotions and events that I uh, went through over the course of last year Uh, and uh, this is also something that that brings uh, my audience to me and and makes people relate to what I do, um, but um, yeah, I I, I think uh, without uh, that, I might have still been struggling uh, with uh, uh, getting the thoughts out of my head and and living through that because again there, there was this uh, um, a lot of. Um, for forbidden um, feelings, like feelings that I'm not allowed to do those things, uh, kind of and also suppressed. thanks to thanks to the project, I also uh, prove to myself and others that I exist. Which is again, as as you mentioned with DAD, uh, one of the things uh, uh, that um, appears uh, uh, quite often is that uh, people with DAD feel like. Uh, that thing doesn't even exist uh, because of the society, sure. how the society views it. Uh, but even worse, uh, the people with the ADL already feel that they don't exist. So they don't have mm. to, to have a society to tell them that uh, because yeah. it's always like, oh, maybe I'm actually that person. Maybe like everyone wants me to be that person. Maybe I actually am. Maybe I'm not myself. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm her. 
And that's where it's the most frustrating. And I actually wrote a song about that too. And it's like one of the most dramatic uh, things I've ever written. Um, uh, it's just, it's really painful uh, to, to uh, struggle to understand mm -hmm. uh, who you are and whether you exist. And again, thanks to that, thanks to my music project i find people who are like me i uh, can uh think those things through so um yeah this is how creativity basically helped me with uh, my um mm -hmm. mental health issues i think it's um you know it's 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 quite it's quite a good if i had to try and make a little bit of a comparison i mean you know like that that in the past, there was a, a lot of mystery around autism. You know, the the basis of what people understood about it was through movies like Rain Man. Um, that was kind of people's perception of what autism is. Um, you know, as as the world has sort of progressed and people, autistic adults and um, and advocates and allies have got online to to talk about it and sort of. Um, I guess address the stigma and and sort of give the the reality the reality of of living um, on the spectrum. Um, people start start to to I guess take it a bit more seriously. You know, like you you can definitely see a a contrast between people nowadays that you talk to um, who use like social media and who who actively you know go on and search things and and see watch content on youtube and you know there's a lot more opportunities for them to really be exposed to um neurodiversity i guess uh, things related to autism and even though it is well it's debatable but even though we are a portion uh, a minority of the population um, because of social media we can all congregate in this massive online circle which is very big you know if you take the world's population um to be to be conservative based on the stats two percent is probably more than that um two percent of what is it like seven eight billion there's still quite a lot of people um and i guess you know one of the one of the issues that might be um you know a problem you know the problem for me talking to perhaps the older generation like my grandparents about it is that they just have no idea how to relate at all. They don't have any comprehension. I can imagine that considering the the rates of, of DID and also the, the stigma around it, it's, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to be able to be open about it, be able to um, genuinely tell people about it without, um, I guess, receiving, you know, the judgment. I guess. Um, do you think that would be a, an, a good comparison or is that? Well, first thing I did uh, when starting this project uh, was just to actually cut off myself from everyone in my life who uh, was from her life, from the past life. Mm -hmm. Yeah because I know that those people would not understand at all because of how different we are. Um, so like all, all her best friends, all her uh, like very close people, they would mm -hmm. not understand a thing of what's going on. Um, and I just realized that it's, it's just, if it's impossible to explain, uh, although again, Admittedly, there were people who understood that something has happened, but when mm -hmm, I approached mm -hmm. them with a diagnosis, some some of them, and that was also a, quite a pain, they were saying that, no, you, you need to search for another doctor, which I did, by the way. I actually had mm -hmm, two mm -hmm. doctors uh, diagnose Good. me, just, you know, to be sure. Um, and, uh, uh <laughs> Yeah, so I, I just realized that I need to be around people who actually are willing to understand uh, mm -hmm. uh, neurodiversity, at least for the time being, before it um, becomes uh, not mainstream, but like something that, that mm -hmm. the 
the world understands because right yeah, now well, it's it, like it is it's, growing it's, <laughs> yeah it, it's growing exactly uh and so uh yeah i i, I don't I'm not thinking about it yet. I know f- that for now, with uh, my audience as is, I can already see that there are so many people who appreciate what I do and they appreciate mm-hmm. what I'm sharing with the world and they uh, they actually understand it. I, I don't know whether it's uh, the, like the, the way I'm explaining it that is more... Um, not, not not relatable, but like people tend to understand what I'm trying to explain. Um, or is it the people, because my audience is like pretty niche because of the genre I'm in, uh, but somehow those those things came together. And I don't think like over the over the year that, uh, that since I started, um, I would have only one or two people who wouldn't believe me. Mm. Uh, yeah. And even then, I provided arguments there's i have a quite a few things that can make anyone uh just stop and listen because i can even like if i if i um give a picture there were people uh, well i don't share my face too much but like if i if i do it in a safe way like there you go look is that the same person and my other self actually doesn't look like me which yeah. is uh, which is crazy, but it's been proven by um, scientists that some people with DID might develop a biologically, uh, physically uh, different uh, uh, appearances, which is wow. crazy. But uh, yeah, we we don't we don't share too much uh, a, a side of our history, our parents, our like background, but otherwise mm-hmm. we are very different. And so I can easily prove to people who um, don't trust me, but luckily there's very many people who, who do trust me, who understand that, that such things can happen in this mad world. Uh, and uh, there is a reason why, why that happens. So, Somehow, so far, I've been very lucky that um, I don't have to uh, go out of my own way to um, prove myself. But still, mm, yeah, I, I am. I'm getting ready for for those things to to happen one day. And I don't know, maybe to a diagnosis mm. could help. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 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 crazy. Just like so. I was talking about like the Rain Man film around autism and stuff. And, you know, there is, there is a lot of movies and a lot of films out there, which hinge upon the, the, the idea of split personalities or multiple personalities. Like that sounds very like in my head, that sounds very similar to the effects that, that Rain Man's had on society. Like I think there was a film, what called split, about the I can't remember his name, the bald headed dude who goes crazy and is a personality where he like crawls on the walls and stuff. Like do you think that the, that that kind of sort of sensationalized media is is kind of harmful to I guess I guess individuals like yourself? I did think about that. Uh I'm not sure. It, it depends on how narrow you look at the movie. If you look at the movie and say, oh, if that's how it happens, then it's happening uh, all, mm. all, all the way through. Although sure. what I liked about this movie is that it portrays uh, the uh, people with um, DID as uh, very unique systems. This is what it is. Like There's very unique systems. If you can have two people inside one head, then and, and it's already uh, something different uh, to what you see um, mm-hmm. from other people, right? So how many actually different mixes of different people could there be? Uh, so it's like, okay, yeah. in one yeah. in one system, there might be evil uh, personalities. In another mm-hmm. system, there might be all harmful personalities. In my s- system, it, the one thing that kind of uh, um, makes us similar is that there are like two very uh hard working individuals this is mm-hmm. i think something that we relate on and that that's 
probably genetics. So very, we're very energetic and, and hardworking. Well, I don't know, uh, just, just that. And so, which is why we're, I think we're pretty adequate and we can actually communicate with each other as opposed to other systems mm. where, where there's like absolute chaos and people, those mm. personalities within the one hand cannot agree with each other. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I actually did like the concept, like how they explained it, that uh, sure. those those changes in, in one's brain can be very unique and that uh, those changes can actually be even physical, which is true. Mm. Uh, this is w- what I have uh, have seen in, we even have like different weight, for instance. It's like my, my yeah. balanced weight, I, I don't change from, from my weight now. And, and she was struggling with uh, her weight, which is 10 kilos more. And she couldn't lose weight ever. I didn't even mm-hmm. have to. I didn't do anything. It's just disappeared. Um, <laughs> she she uh, was binge eating all the time when she was stressed. When I'm mm-hmm. stressed, I don't eat at all. I just, I, I hate food. Like, uh, that's how bad it is. And this is, this is like different uh, hormonal systems, different um, uh, physical, like, biorhythms and, and stuff is, mm-hmm. uh, this is how crazy uh, the difference are uh, differences are oh, thank you very much for that I um, yeah it's, it's it's really interesting to me to, to you know I'm always very very keen and very interested in learning about different you know brains and and their experiences and I'm always you know I'm always very I guess I just want to say that I I appreciate you sort of telling me about it. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that, no tricks. Dreadnought's also been uh, sitting by very very quietly, patiently waiting. I guess um, I want to know a little bit about a little bit more about sort of your experiences with um, mental health and and how creativity has sort of had a positive influence on your life yeah um i mean w- when it comes to like my mental health it's there's one particular moment i wasn't sure if i was going to speak about it or not to be honest because it's not really something i've spoken much about but everyone's been very open and honest and it has made me comfortable enough to speak about this one particular point uh there was an event that happened i unfortunately i lost my best friend at the time um when i was in so it's just going into the so second sorry. year of uni. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's, it's the past. Um, it's, it's something I've, you know, I've learned and I've accepted now. It's an unfortunate reality. Um, you know, I, I went through a lot of therapy through it. And, and you know, it's something that I've accepted now. And when I think back on it, it's still quite painful, but there's a lot of love there. But I remember mm-hmm. very much at the time, um, there was a lot of darkness within me. There was a lot of recklessness as well. Um mm-hmm. It was unfortunately it was drug related, um, and weirdly enough, I went down a spiral not long after that, where I was cramming all sorts of things down my throat, up my nose. Uh, I was in a very, very unhealthy situation, and I had a lot of like toxicity within me, a lot of like mm-hmm. hatred for what had happened, and I, I felt like I wanted to like I, I just hated the world. I didn't care for myself or anything around me really. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really have a lot of respect for myself either. Um, And that anger kind of weirdly enough was the formation of when I really started to like dig into these darker roots of dreadnought, these like really tough topics. Um, But before that I was trying all sorts of different things um, and these different emotions, they weren't resonating with my music the way I wanted, but this like rage and anger and stuff like it felt good and it was one of the few things that like made me feel good without having to uh, I guess it kind of comes similar into like FMA's story as well it was like one of the few things that felt good like and it felt like I was being productive from it I wasn't just burning all my money on things that would make me forget the night anyway I wasn't he's just slowly killing ventures. myself yeah yeah very much so um, and it started with the, I think that made like a real foundation 
And don't get me wrong, like I'm, I'm not saying all my music is going to be pure like venom and anger and like pouring it out. <laughs> I'm always like trying different things and like trying to work it. But that gave me a real foundation to be like, there's there's something tapped here for me that I've tapped into. I can tap into my emotions and use it productively. Fortunately, a lot of therapy along the way really helped with that as well, and it helped. Sure. You know, my therapist at the time, she really helped me funnel me into that direction of, okay, this is something that you're doing that is productive and healthy. It's not something that is, you know, extremely destructive. And don't get me wrong, like, there were times where I thought I got over it and I hadn't and, you know, fell back into similar patterns. Um, But every time, one of the major things that pulled me out of that and pulled me back to a reality, back to the wanting to grow and be a better person um, and wanting to put these emotions out in a healthy manner uh, it was music. It, it, hmm. it was always the thing that would pull me back. It was, it, I, there would be days where I'd come in, I'd be like, I'd be miserable, I'd be so depressed. But I'd pull myself up to do the laptop, put, open my laptop, and yeah, I wasn't even necessarily planning on recording anything. I'd just play about on the piano, and I'd literally sit like bloody Phantom of the Opera, you know, moody <laughs> in my room, headphones on, just playing like different organ settings and like these massive reverbed pianos and just expression expressing what I, I could, I couldn't really play that well at the time either. I could only really play in minor keys. So <laughs> it was very dark and moody, but from that, it, you know, it was, it was, it was dirty roots that started growing into something much more, you know, beautiful and poetic, I guess, if you will, um, mm-hmm. not to, <laughs> not to like flaunt it like you know I, 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 I don't, I don't want to draw the you know the stigma there of like you know where like people think these really genuinely serious like mental health problems can be romanticized for the sake of you know yeah, artists, yeah. Things, you know it's kind of like the gothic angle on yeah yeah, yeah it's it's, yeah. it's weird you say that because i i definitely did for a long time like yeah yeah same it's, same. it's almost like because I, I, it tends to be with my mental health is I tend to sit anywhere between mild and moderate in terms of anxiety and depression, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. most of the time. Mm-hmm. But there, there does tend to be either, either anywhere between one and three periods um, throughout the year where my serotonin just absolutely drops and goes. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I think I do understand that. Yeah, and if I think, you know, just get going through those cycles constantly since the age of about fourteen, it's been like nearly a decade now, which is crazy to say. It was like eleven yeah. years. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think my mentality has very much changed because I always wanted to to cure myself. Yeah. I always wanted yeah. to get rid of it, and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. really, the mentality was is to manage it. And mm-hmm. to put things in place when I'm in a severe, severe period and to, to feel okay and doing less and being less productive and, yeah. you know, doing different things and, and being like, hey, it's actually productive to manage this in the best way possible so I can get back to, to me again. I don't have to do mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. and full steam ahead like I was when my mental health was a bit better. Yeah. Um, and there's was, there was also an aspect of, you know, really um, – you know, throughout, throughout my life, I've had really intense spells of like uh, existential um, feelings. Like um, mm-hmm. there was a period of t- period of time at university for about anywhere from three to four weeks where I didn't go outside and I just stayed in my room and you know yeah. with the blinds closed uh-huh, and uh-huh. I was having like multiple panic attacks a day and I was yeah. watching videos on the nature of time and physics and i literally Mm -hmm. felt like i was in a different dimension i was like i've been in a very very similar feeling in in the past you know i i've 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 hit them sinks as well um like it's pretty much exactly like you said you know you lock yourself away you know Mm -hmm. you close yourself off from the world and you just kind of feed into them emotions and them feelings Mm -hmm. and like you said with you i remember my first panic attack and i was literally just going to the shop to buy a sandwich and I uh, just remember that feeling and it terrified me and I didn't go out for like, I think it must've been like 10 days or something. It's after really that well. hard to describe exactly what that kind of, I mean, the, the only way that I could really translate it into terms that people could understand is, is like, you know, if you're watching a TV show your entire life, 
Mm. You watch like these same three seasons over and over again. And then suddenly in one of the episodes, the character looks at the screen and talks to you. That's the kind of feeling that you get when you have that yeah. existential fear. Yeah. And, it, and yeah, yeah. it really, That's a really, it really good plunged me into like the, the depths of, of nihilism. And I, mm-hmm. I literally mm-hmm. dissolved any concept of what anything was into mm-hmm. nothing. I was like, I can't even think, I can't even speak, I can't even do things. And it's, it's it an was, incredibly dark position to be in. And it, it takes a lot, a lot to mm-hmm. pull yourself out of it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's ultimately, it comes down to you, you know, it comes, it's something that I discovered and I, I kept waiting, like thinking in the back of my mind that maybe someone would be able to pull me out of this. Like, cause it's yeah. like, it's always got to be you that does it ultimately. But, but then again, know, when you're in that, it's, it's like a romant. it's like a romanticizing. It's like, I don't mm-hmm. want to be pulled out of this state of enlightenment. Like yeah, it yeah. causes me intense pain and discomfort and emotional distress, but but you feel like you know I, everything. Like you, I you feel know like the reality. I see things. Like yeah, I can yeah, see yeah. what's going on, and I yeah. understand all the confusion. And it's like, yeah. um, very very strange state to be in. But mm-hmm. being in those states, um, you know, there was there's time. You know, I went to uh, Thailand to do like a research placement. I was studying mosquitoes and stuff. And oh wow. Uh, that's, that was, that's that really was cool. Big... That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a lot of. I had to dissect mosquitoes using like two needles. It was. Ooh. I had to take out their ovaries and grind look them up and that, look yeah, under the a, microscope. And uh, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it's not my cup of tea. No, no, no. That, no but, that's um, fair enough. That's completely fair enough. Yeah. And the studying aspect and learning about like nature and biology is cool, but. <laughs> then you, them kind of great things. I completely get that. It's not for me either. <laughs> I think the, the, there was during that time going, going during that time in Thailand, cause it was such a, a change in environment, change in atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Really. I kind of, I kind of had just a, a moment of realization where I was like, that I'm, I'm constantly chasing this feeling of being happy mm-hmm. that, and and not depressed or not anxious at least Mm -hmm. um that it really was was more of a self-destructive thing and i was like hey actually maybe if i focus on something external if i have some kind of intrinsic meaning that i'm striving to rather than a feeling that's you know you can't yeah you you can never make someone feel what you're feeling you know Mm -hmm. so it's it's hard to ever find peace in that so yeah you know for me it was 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 helping people and yeah you know through wanting to inform people about my experiences and trying to help them um of course get through similar situations to myself Mm -hmm. um it actually made me feel better yeah of course it's like it's like why share groups are so important it's just even that simple simplicity of finding out somebody relates to your situation and being able to express that and I, mm-hmm. I remember even like when I was like struggling horribly with stuff, I would still like speak to other people that were going through stuff. And it, it, yeah. it, you would feel a little bit better knowing that like the leaving it does a bit ground better. You. Yeah. And it does it's very much that too. Yeah. That, yeah, definitely. That sort of. it's, it's like you said, it's not, you spend so long striving for happiness, but it's like, that's not the way to approach it. It shouldn't be. I'm chasing mm-hmm. this feeling as such it's finding the things that give you that feeling sure but like that's that's a part of it and i i kind of i've kind of lost my trail a bit there like how to word, <laughs> no word that thought um, so i guess it's okay with you it's table turn. if it's okay with you i'm going to move on to um no absolutely not. um 12 gauge talk a little bit about i know um fma you've taught you talked about a little bit about mental health and stuff so well i'll talk to uh 12 gauge talk, talk a little bit to fma about mental health then we'll kind of try and wrap things up and sort of end the podcast episode i i, I guess right. yeah i mean 12 gauge do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the the benefits that and i know you've talked about it um both you and fma have mm-hmm. talked about it a little bit but um what kind of benefits did you see like wh- how did being more creative help you feel better in yourself and and manage the the difficulties that you've been through um, it gave me purpose. That's yeah. kind of what I see it as. Um, 
I'm not going to lie. A lot of the time, creativity infuriates me because I... <laughs> I'm doing a master's course and I work with FME who is, yeah, yeah, he's, um, he's a perfectionist, an obsessive perfectionist. And when it comes to his creativity, <laughs> he doesn't relent on it whatsoever. You, you, you give a hundred percent and he can tell when you're giving 98%. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do find it infuriating, but I feel like that's what happens when you love something. Like, yeah. like I, I said it to um, FMA, we're walking to band practice once, and I just said to him, like, I feel like the difference is, is when I was a teenager and I was sat there and I was listening to all that rap and I was writing all those lyrics, that was me first meeting a girl and like, oh, those were the mm-hmm. first few dates. And now I've been married for two years to creativity and it's a job mm-hmm. to love creativity. But yeah. it is the thing that gives me purpose. At the end of the day, there are so many points in my life where I could have just went off the path and just, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. become like a hermit. Like I struggled with um, a lot of the things that like Dreadnought was saying of like wanting to isolate myself and never leave the house, never interact with anyone ever again. And, you know, thinking the world is just a horrible, horrible place and creativity has always been there it has always Mm -hmm. been a thing that i can rely on no matter how many friends like we fall out or if i break up with someone or whatever i always have a pen and a paper and i always have me that i can work on and i can do it Mm -hmm. through Mm -hmm. creativity and i think it's it's massively beneficial i think it's highly underrated in society in general because you know in a capitalist society make money that's all you have to do just make as much money as possible not you know do something for the fact that you love it and i think everyone should be able to have that thing that they just love doing like the thing Mm -hmm. that always annoys me like always annoys me is when people come up to me after we've done a set or after they've heard a song and they turn around to me and they're like, oh, I could never do that. I could never do that. Oh, you, you, you're so talented. And I was there like, you, this is like nine to ten years of sitting with a pen and paper and yeah. scrapping it and then rewriting it and getting better and learning new words to rhyme and learning what I actually want to sound like and all of that stuff. The difference is, is that there's like there's that beginning stage where you're you're just passionate about it and a lot of the time Mm -hmm. because of how society is set up if it's not making money why are you doing it Mm -hmm. and then it gets to the point where it's not making money so why do you keep doing it you don't you just stop and i think that there Mm -hmm. are so many people out there i think there are so many amazing rappers, amazing lyricists, amazing rock bands out there, amazing artists in general who have never become amazing artists because people have said to them, why are you doing this? It isn't making money. And I think that's, I think it's, that's horrible. Sorry, I think because it shouldn't be about yeah. the money. It should be about making you feel good. If the money happens, that's just a positive. And I think, I think as well, because, um, you know, we're living in a time where social media and the, the internet is such a massive part of everyone's life, Mm. um, for, for a lot of people's lives. And, um, you know, with that comes a lot of opportunity Yeah. to, you know, what you need is, is a setup at home and a, and a connection and you can go anywhere you want in the world. You can talk to anyone that you want to talk to. Mm. Um, you don't have to travel. You don't have to get horse and carriage and <laughs> go or get a train and a flight just to get to go chat to somebody. You can actually just you know do like what we're doing and just just jump on a call, yeah. have a chat and stuff. But you know the the issue comes in there is that there will be a lot of opportunity, and that means there will be a lot of people. Yeah, and you know what happens in in hierarchies is you know people. Um, especially in the creative industry, there is a very 
small amount of the large population of creative people who manage to get to a certain point. Mm. And they're, they're, they're kind of the weird dynamic is with the creative industry is that creativity is something that, that comes comes to you and it's something that you develop slowly and it's something that comes best when you're relaxed or yeah. when you feel comfortable. Um, but on the flip side, you've got to get the deadline. You've got to do this. You've got to do this for a certain amount of time. You've got yeah. like, you know, perhaps in the in the past, you'd have a painter who'd come home from working his job in the mine shaft or something and um, whips out his his paintbrush and he just he does as much as he wants to and that's his his creativity but you know trying to make it as like a creative person you've you've got to be creative and you've got to be very fast at doing it yeah and you've got to do all of this other stuff um and so there's like there's more opportunity to do it Mm. but then there's there's so much more competition where it it just whittles down to this highly creative very very fast producing yeah individuals that are just it's it's it can make it really really difficult for um a lot of creative people in in any in any industries whether it be podcasts or writing or yeah uh, or music it's so hard to to get to that point where it becomes something that you can just do oh yeah so yeah definitely like, and i feel that i think the one massive reason that like me and fma like we like go on about this all the time but you know that everyone should create everyone should do that even if it's like you know you're drawing stick men fighting at the back of your workbook (laughs) or something it's it is expression and the way the social media is the way that everyone is currently is yeah you're you're right to express yourself but you've got to express the best version of yourself you can't constantly you can't take a picture time. of you screaming at a wall because you've woke up 10 minutes late for work and you've missed the bus yeah. you can't do that but if you write that if you just write a story and it doesn't have to be good but about that same guy missing that bus for work you've expressed mm. that thought and that feeling rather than bottling mm. it and just keeping it locked in the back of your head to just eat away at you for another week and then something else happens yeah. and you bottle it and you bottle it. And I think it is that massive con of social media that it has given us the ability to talk to anyone, to express ourselves however we want. But now there is the perfect way of expressing yourself. You should always be as beautiful yeah. as possible. You should always be as yeah. fit as possible. You should be in the sunny beaches of Barbados, but you can't <laughs> afford it. So, you know, you can't get there. But, you know, there, there is the way of showing yourself to the world. And creativity, to me, is the way of expressing who you truly are and not being afraid yeah. to do that in whatever form it is. And that's what it does for me, I think. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tov Gage. Yeah, round of applause. Yay. Yeah, everyone's happy, but we don't, we don't have our audios on, so <laughs> imagine it in your heads. Um <laughs> I've got standing ovation in Thank your head, you everyone imagine it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so FMA, um, it's uh, down to you for the last uh, question as well. Um, I know you talked to, uh, talked a lot about sort of your experiences with mental health. I mean, if you can kind of like, what what does what does creativity do for you, like? Like nowadays, because you, you talked about it, sort of your past and how that's been sort of a really great outlet. But nowadays, what what does you know diving back into that creative world of your son, like what does that do for you? I don't know, because that's like asking me what breathing does. It's like so natural. It's just that's what I do. That is my purpose. Mm-hmm. It's like it, there is no choice in it um even when i'm on a break so let's say i create like this crazy big thing and i'm like absolutely burnt out and exhausted how i go and relax is by creating something else in another format (laughs) uh and it's like it's how it's just my brain just constant my brain does not stop and that's it gets very exhausting sometimes and so Mm. putting my brain to use is like it's relaxing is that if that makes sense yeah um so like i yeah it's it's a bit hard to answer your question. 
I, f- I find with myself, um, I mean, we, we have different, there's this concept called the default mode network, which is basically, um, I mean, it's, it's characterized using like ECGs and like understanding like brain waves, like different brain states, like what, like beta and alpha and stuff like that. And it's basically used to characterize the brain when you've got nothing to do. Yep. Um, it's the, the chatter. It's the, mm-hmm. the thoughts coming, coming in and coming out and some, some thoughts coming in and sticking there and you're paying attention to it and then it becomes more stuff and it branches off. That's kind of what like the default me- network is not is like, and I find that that experience, and it's been shown in in the literature as well, that that can be very very stressful, yeah. and it, it does burn your energy stores. And I find that having something particular to focus on, you know, like if I was to go through my day, it would be I wake up, I watch a video, I I go to work, I focus on work, I finish work. I watch a video, I go to the gym, I come back, I do some work on my social media, I go to sleep. And there's like, there's no space that I give myself in there to like, um, I guess just to do nothing. Yeah. And, um, you know, for me, I think, I think it can definitely, if, if I keep going in that, that, that those stages, I mean, it helps me a lot to push aside how I'm feeling, like what I'm, you know, if I'm very, very depressed and I'm having a lot of depressive thoughts when I don't have anything to do, I will continue to do stuff like constantly and fill my diary of different things to do. And it does sort of help me. Um, and I, but, but after a while, like maybe, you know, if I was to do that for two or three weeks, there will come, come to a point where my brain just starts like slowly winding down and, and shutting down. And, and I find that those those periods of time you know, I have burnouts. I, I I struggle to to do anything. Like it's like my brain just decides that it wants to run a full like computer reset on on me. And I think you know one of the things that's been really helpful um, for me is you know when I'm at the gym, I try to think about nothing. I don't I don't go on my phone. I don't watch social media. I just put on my music and I just kind of be in the moment and and do that and not, not try to do stuff, but I'm still doing something, but I'm not thinking, I'm not using the energy. Um, and also things like meditation, you know, meditation, it, it, it basically teaches you how to do nothing. Yeah. Like, uh, think about nothing, like avoid that default mode network, but also be able to do that, that ignore that default mode. My God. Mm-hmm. It teaches you to to do nothing without defaulting to that <clears throat> that state of, of thoughts constantly going around in your head and stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Without you having to latch on to a task or to focus on something. Yeah. Um and I, I find that really useful because I, I do definitely, like yourself, have a tendency to really hone in and focus on something and you know that becomes my life. These these focuses that I have, that's like my my life up until a point that I can't do it anymore. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I I definitely think like things like meditation and also you know yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Go on, go for it. I interrupted you. <laughs> I can't help that. Do you ever get that, Thomas? Where like your brain's got a thought? Oh, it's, 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 it's a say it's it, a say common... it, Matthew. Say it. It doesn't matter if there's a million people stood in Michigan being silent. Say that thought, Matthew. That's what I get. I would like to also add. Sometimes. I feel that. <laughs> yeah. Conversational tempo. It's yeah. um tends tends to be with, with autism. You you find it hard to find natural breaks in conversation. So you like you kind of I I learn to just blurt stuff out because it's like that's yeah that's exactly what i do oh oh, sorry and then then it's reset and then you can talk it's like (laughs) yeah it kind of hurts to keep it in so i was really lucky at university but i had a tutor who let me ask questions all the time because my hand was just going up all the time he didn't mind it it would have been an issue if exactly the same but yeah right okay i came up with some responses and some things to say while you were talking uh Mm -hmm. my brain kind of works on two separate levels it's really really weird 
And it's always been there, like there's this level above my level. So Matthew's here, this is Matthew. I remember mm-hmm. something above, and it's always been there. I remember being a child, and this part was thinking like an adult, and it was going like, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. Well, I was just playing around and stuff. And people would talk to me, and I'd be like, oh, is that what you mean? But then this part up here would be going, no, that's not what they mean. There's this going on, and this going on, and this going on. Mm-hmm. And as the years progressed, this thing above was always going on, no matter what. And I could never, ever shut it up. Alcohol, drugs, and things, that was the only yeah, way of shutting yeah. it up. But when I got my diagnosis and everything started to coalesce and I started to understand things, I gave it a name and I called it exactly. Zach. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I called it uh, Zach and I've, I've made him a home to live in. And he lives in an attic in my head and it's dark up there and it's it's massive. It's unbelievably massive. And there's books on every single shelf. It's just a huge library of knowledge and things. And he's all this mm. spindly giant creature with these evil eyes and he, he marches around and bangs and stuff. And the metaphor that I've come up with, how my brain works is, there's a trap door in the attic that leads down, but it doesn't lead up. And so mm-hmm. if Zach's in a good mood, he might give me inspiration all day. He might go, oh, this idea is awesome. This idea is awesome. This idea is awesome. This idea is awesome. Mm-hmm. Or he might give me memories that I don't even remember having. Or he might tell me what people actually mean when they speak, not the words that they say, the words behind the words that they're saying, if that makes kind sense. Of like, kind of like yeah. you're a- it's sort of like, a manifestation of your unconscious Yeah, like, that, that person over there is really, really worried about someone stealing something off them. Do you know what that means, Matthew? That means that they steal lots of things from other people because that's what they're scared <laughs> of. And like, it does all this psychology and it drops it all down on me, yeah, like so yeah. much information. Um, but then there are days when Zach's bad and the only things he drops down are like images that I've seen from the past or horrible thoughts or like he whispers mm. like, like, oh, you're ugly today, Matthew. And just like stuff like that, just crazy stuff. And then he might invent these horrific scenes and be like, hey, you are, Matthew, deal with this. Um, but that's how my head works. And all this stuff that's been dropped through the trap door, it's my job to keep getting out because when I don't, it just that's when I get poorly, if that makes sense. Mm, So it's like, mm. even there's only one time when it ever went quiet. And like during COVID, when me and Callum spent a year writing our second album, because that's how long it takes that we're in. We don't spend a week writing at something. We spent a year. And at the end of it, I genuinely, it, it was the most exhausting thing that I've ever done. But, for the first time in my life that thing above me shut up and it it wasn't there it disappeared for the first time ever and it was like i was trying to find this joy in creating things i was trying to find this joy in life i was trying to find this joy in anything and it's just like everything had just disappeared mm-hmm. and then no tricks appeared on the scene and, and <laughs> she like triggered it all coming back uh which was really weird like how she came in at that moment but yeah so that's how my my head works it kind of like there's two layers to it i don't know if you identify with that thomas or not but that's how it's always been like i I don't have control i mean for me it's um i made i made a a youtube video like uh two or three years ago or or like a post um titled my split brain and it was basically it was kind of you know in, in in my life like as i was growing up i kind of split myself into my logical brain and my emotional brain like i think it was something to do with alexithymia because i just it's 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 like when you're alexithymic it's kind of like your thoughts and your emotions can be completely different constantly and it's and like the connection between the two is very very muddied and it takes a lot of work to find the connection between the two um and i i definitely I definitely found that Um, when you were, when you were talking about sort of um, thinking about this, this, this kind of uh, unconscious entity that's like feeding you different thoughts and feeding you different emotions and, and memories and stuff. It reminds me very much of like the, the sports psychology book, the, uh, the monkey mind or something like that. Oh yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. 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 I think, I think for us, it's, you know, that, that kind of ex, experience because our brains are so different and we have such different experiences of like perceiving and thinking and feeling um it can be very very useful sometimes to have like you know analogies like that um i definitely as as i've sort of got older and i've sort of understood for myself like uh, alexithymia and uh i i it's it's I found more ways to kind of find links between the two and sort of 
I feel I feel a lot more now like myself because I've integrated that that emotional part of me. I used to be the thoughts. Like I didn't identify with the emotions at all. It was like I have these thoughts, but my emotions are doing this. And um I used to always think that and I think it it did come to a point where I kind of you know, I, I really wanted to explore the more emotional side of me because I was I was one of those autistic people. I was like, I don't need friends. I don't need emotions. Emotions are illogical. I'm a logical creature. I can do everything, and I'm better for, for not having these emotions. And I was just pushing these this emotional side of myself out. And it, it, it did kind of, in the long run, you know, harm me. Like, it was it was good for me to actually understand a bit more about how I felt and why I felt things. And I think, um, you know, that, that, that feeling of having that, that split between my emotions and my thinking, um, it helped me sort of, to a certain extent, understand what was going on at the time. Um, you know, now that I came across things like Alexa Fire it's helped me feel a little bit more whole. Like I, it's just, you know, sometimes you feel stuff, and you know that you shouldn't feel stuff like, like, oh, it doesn't make any sense to you. And it's like, yeah. sometimes you're right. It doesn't make any sense. It's completely logical, but sometimes it actually, you know, you're feeling that for a reason. So it's like yeah. navigating that crazy, crazy, crazy thing it took me years and years and years to try and come to that conclusion. But I think writing about it, learning about philosophy and psychology and my brain trying to explain it to other people really helped with that, with that kind of that weird feeling. <laughs> yeah. I get you. I understand. But yeah, it comes down to just creating things and getting it out and just exploring yeah. and learning. Yeah, me, that for was every writing. single one of us. Yeah. Definitely. That's cool. Well, um, we have just nearly hit the two hours and the 15 minutes mark. And, um, We've got through two questions out of three, but I think like we we've had a good chat about yeah. like different aspects of creativity. We've talked about um, you know our, our different neurodiversities, how that that's shaped our perception of the world, how creativity has been been an outlet for, um, I guess, you know, pr- pr- providing providing us an outlet when the, the, there's nowhere else to go. I think. You know, creativity is a, is a, an incredible thing. You know, it's something that I used to make fun of, like artists and like stuff. I was like, oh, it's just art. Ah, like, we need cold logic and stuff. And you know, really, it, it is. It's it's pretty much one of the the best mediums for communicating human experience and emotions. I mean, I'm not really sure how to round this up because we, we've been chatting for so long and <laughs> we've had a lot of different sort of. We do um, the, we do the different... neurodivergent crew pause and then all shoot off into the air. That's what we do. Yeah. Like the Power Rangers. <laughs> 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 just fly yeah. off and goodbye. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's been, it's been awesome. Thank you very much for having us on, Thomas. It's been really, really amazing. And I'm proud of every single one of the crew for how they've spoken today. Oh, yeah. You've, you've all been incredibly open and vulnerable. And it's been, been really great to, to hear the experience of life from from different perspectives i mean thank you thank you thank so you. much and i'm sure the people who are listening in they'll um they'll really appreciate you know you you guys being so so open about this you know talking about mental health talking about passions talking about negative experiences in life mm-hmm. there's not enough platforms like like this where people can actually just feel comfortable in like just just talking about stuff that you know it's important to talk about but sensationalist media everyone's yeah. got to get stuff in 60 seconds and it's like no one sits through and uh well no. people do sit through my, yeah. my listeners sit through but <laughs> just the more we talk about it the more people learn the more people accept and that's our job we just need to keep talking and talking and talking not now because we've gone to two hours 16 minutes yes I mean, yeah. in real life <laughs> well um i guess what i want to say is thank you and um 
as far as the song of the day, of course, we're going to stick that down um, in the song of the day playlist. The new um, what 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 is the name of the song? Look, go on, no tricks. Which is DAD autism ADHD dyslexia. So Dardy for short. Dardy, 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 C D A A D Y. Yeah. So if if you guys out there want to um, listen to the song, I uh, highly recommend you do. You you can find music uh, suggestions from pretty much every single um, guest on uh, season two. So go over to the Spotify link in the description. And while you're there, please do give my podcast a rating. If you are on anything, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, please give me a rating. Five-star variety would be very appreciated, but understand. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for tuning in. And um, if you want to catch the podcast on YouTube, you'll be able to find the video version of this where you get to see all of our lovely faces. Um talking and um yeah uh, make sure to go over to my instagram at thomas henley to get updates on how the podcast is going um get updates on my life the kind of work that i'm doing i am starting at the moment um a, a new business starting my own business as a sole trader i'm going to be doing autism coaching um for for autistic adults um so if that's something that you're interested in go over to my website thomashenley.co.uk and i do realize that i'm shouting a lot of links at everybody and um (laughs) um yeah i will definitely put down if you guys can create like a a group link tree like of everybody's links on it that would be absolutely amazing oh okay cool yes um so that link tree along with my own be down in the description very 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 close to the top uh, you'll be able to find all of the music and all of the social media sites and the websites and all of that stuff from our very lovely guests and uh yeah i really hope you have enjoyed this uh, episode of the 40 Audi podcast please let me know down in the comments what you think of having more than one guest on did you like it do you feel like it's a lot to, to process and to um digest maybe (laughs) something along those lines uh yeah guys have you uh have you enjoyed your experience of the uh 40 audi podcast yes it's been amazing thank you so much thomas yeah it's been awesome it's been really cool thank you thank you so much thank you for having us and for for such a safe atmosphere to share our (laughs) thoughts and Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made us all feel very you. comfortable, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, 100%. thank you. Well, with that, I hope you all have a very, very lovely day. And I'll see you on the next episode of the 40 Audi podcast. See you later, guys. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. You can say Adios. you can say bye in a group oh, and be all noisy. Bye. 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 Bye.